Well, first, I want to say thanks to the Creative Mornings team. Uh, and say thanks to uh, Little Salon too and Chris uh, for putting this all together. Um, good morning, uh, since it is Creative Mornings from Southeast DC, where the uh, fireworks are getting closer and closer to seismic every week. Uh, I think we'll we'll be on the Richter scale by Fourth uh, of July. Um, I'm just wondering where where people get access to some of this weapons grade uh, fireworks because uh, some of these things are incredible. Um, I want to thank uh, Raquel uh, specifically for that invocation um, and acknowledgement of the fact that uh, so many things are converging uh, at this moment in particular ways that are allowing uh, certain insights suddenly. Um, as someone who you know can remember uh, being a young person and watching um, Rodney King get beat um, on a tape, right, um, and having that happen over and over again. Um, that I keep asking myself and asking some of my other, uh, my referred to as OGs, like what's what's different about this moment um, that is bringing us to this reckoning that all those other moments uh, haven't. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we, we can and should continue to work out um, and what role the you know convergence of all these different crises uh, has in that. Um, I also want to thank Mo for her her, her work, uh, their work, and also. Um, Acknowledge that it's great to see them evolve. Um, I remember when they were on the uh, DCU slam team and, and just to continue to see growth is a beautiful thing. Um, and to acknowledge, uh, at the end of the week, I've been, I've been telling everyone since uh, this pandemic started, congratulations, right? Because um, you are, um, as uh, Mo said, still alive. Um, and there are many of us uh, for various reasons who don't make it to the end of the week. Uh, this year. Um, so just congratulations on that. It, it is very real. Um, and, you know, I do want to keep us all, as many of us, you know, with us to 2021 and beyond um, as possible. So uh, I'm going to, uh, there's this James Baldwin speech. If you, if you never heard it, James Baldwin gives a speech at Berkeley I think it's like 1979 or maybe 1981. Um, C-SPAN has it archived, you should watch it. But um, in the beginning of the speech, uh, he says, you know, I'm gonna improvise on some things as a writer. Um, and of course, like he goes on to give this brilliant speech about um, the nature of uh, structural racism. Um, I'm not aspiring to that, but I am gonna say that I'm gonna improvise uh, on a couple of things as a writer. Um, and some thoughts about one, you know, insecurity, uh, which, you know, like fear, I don't think necessarily has a, uh, a negative um, con connotation. Um, I think insecurity can be neutral, right? Um, there are times when we need it uh, and times when it presents a problem. So insecurity um, and the creative process and how those things sort of fit together and sort of shape our, our thinking and how creative people, artists, uh, are very necessary in this moment because of the relationship between the creative process and creative uh, and insecurity, as I see it. Um, I'm sure like for many creatives, this has been a bit of a whiplash, right? Going from the COVID crisis in which it felt like, man, you know, I'm an artist, like, people are dying, like what what value, you know, what purpose immediate, you know, do I have right now? I'm not an essential worker. Um, and I think the way right now what we're dealing with with this um, social strife and reckoning with uh, racial injustice that, you know, artists are becoming, you know, returning to their space as essential workers too. Um, so I am a poet, uh, a writer, a uh, professor of uh, literature, um, so I do have a certain sensitivity to language. And of course, you know, in the wake of everything that's been going on, um, I've been picking up on the disingenuous ways that, you know, politicians have been, you know, using language to sort of escape the reality um, of, of what we're dealing with, right? Um, unfortunately, I'll even say one is, you know, the way that our, our mayor, uh, Muriel Bowser, has sort of, you know, co-opted uh, the language of Black Lives Matter to sort of uh, perpetuate kind of a personal fight with the president that doesn't really serve the purpose of um, the Black Lives Matter 
movement. Um, but another thing, you know, that I've noticed is that when you have um, politicians talking about, you know, police reform and defunding the police, um, that often one thing you'll hear is that, well, you know, I don't believe um, that there are hateful. I don't. I don't believe you have police forces full of hateful people. You don't have police forces full of, you know, quote unquote, um, bad cops. Um, and I have lots of law enforcement in my family myself. And, you know, I, I think that sort of misses the mark because I think it's easy, it's fairly easy for, you know, someone to avoid or honestly say like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not a hateful person. Um, I'm not a bad person, bad being so abstract. What does it even mean? Um, but I think, you know, beneath that, right? Um, Cause you know, power, you know, sets up, you know, the sort of the issues of structural racism, power creates these things, but people maintain them, right? People socially maintain these structures that uh, keep certain uh, of us oppressed, right? And I think a big part of that um, is the fact that we uh, project our insecurities in a way that uh, maintain these structures, right? Um, and I, I think for me, like how we, how we face insecurity, how we process insecurity um, individually and how that builds into a ground squirrel is gonna be a big part of how we, we move you know, through this moment. You know, we hear so many people talking about not wanting to go back to normal, um, whatever normal was before this. And I, I think that um, we'll do that if we all sort of like individually and collectively you know, reckon with, you know, the insecurities that are, you know, guiding the decisions we make, guiding um, the policies that we live under. Um, and I think artists in the way that we sort of manage and work with insecurity in our creative processes can be, you know, interesting models for that. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen a bit. I don't have a lot of slides, but just a few. Um, so Uh, my grandmother um, was a Broadway singer in a previous life. Uh, before that, um, eventually she went on to become a, uh, a police officer. She was the first uh, African-American female detective in the history of North New Jersey. Um, she started out as what was called, uh, back then she refers to the rape unit for the best domestic violence. Um, but in her, her life as a performer, you know, she would go into New York, you know, go across the river from North into North New York and um, audition for things. She was actually in Carmen Jones. She was in the original Carmen Jones um, and St. Louis Woman, uh, St. Louis Woman too. Um, she toured with that, she toured with Carmen Jones. Um, so she would tell me these stories about, you know, going on auditions. And there's one story that uh, she would always tell me um, what you see on the screen, that's my interpretation of her advice. My grandmother did not tell me that. My grandmother did not tell me how to do your own bullshit. Um, that's sort of the, the way that I, I shaped it for my students. Um, but so she, she went on this one audition and um, I forget what the show was. And she showed up um, and, you know, she sang. She was a singer. That was her, her primary talent. And, um, you know, at the end, they were like, okay, good. We, we, we love your voice. You know, well, can you dance or do anything? And um, you know, she, she called for a minute and she said, uh, you know, no, you know, that's, that's not really my, uh, my bag. And so then they said, oh, well, okay, thank you for you know, auditioning. We love your voice, but we're probably going to you know, look for someone who's a singer and dancer. And as she was leaving the audition, um, <clears throat> another one of her, her friends who's also sort of a, in the scene sort of stopped her on the street and said, you know, what the hell is wrong with you? Like, if someone, you know, asks you a question, you say, yes, I can, and you do whatever, you do whatever's in your capability, and you let them tell you no, right? You know, you don't sort of shut yourself down um, before you've given yourself uh, an opportunity. So I think, you know, a, a part of entering the creative process, which I'll, I'll talk about a bit, is that the ability to believe your own bullshit, to sort of like keep, keep, keep you going, to have that audacity, right? Um, but the audacity only gets you so far into the creative process. And at a certain point where you kind of have to reckon with um, the effects, better and worse, um, of insecurity. And uh, so just briefly, and I know I saw like one or two of my, my students uh, on here, so they, they may have seen this before, but I, I like to think through sort of 
uh, the four step conception of the creative process a lot um, to think about uh, artistic production. Uh, if you've never seen this before, um, it's sort of like um, kind of like the automatic uh, version. You think about the, auto, the automatic engine, sort of like the automatic version of how one moves through. It's like very structured. You know, every artist sort of has their own their own way of uh, gauging with this. But if you want to think about these four stages, right? You know, there's there's this first stage, sort of like the unconscious, sort of receptive phase, where you're just moving through the world absorbing uh, stimuli that may or may not right, turn into something. Um, then there's a second phase, sort of the incubation and brainstorming phase where you're, you're consciously starting to think, hmm, like maybe there's a connection between this and maybe there's a connection between that. Like maybe there's something there that you know, I, I might want to work with. Third stage, sort of like the artic articulation and production phase, um, that point where you're actually like producing, you're, you're actually trying to, to render something actively. Um, in the last phase of the revision um, or the verification phase, you, you look at what you did and maybe you go back to that second phase, you know, that incubation brainstorming phase, you think about, hmm, you know, how, how close is what I produce uh, to how close does it match what I was thinking about in that, that brainstorming phase. And uh, I like to think about it sort of like, you know, you have the image there, it's sort of like the four cycle engine, um, four cycle diesel engine, like in that initial stage, like the intake, you know, the gas is drawing, uh, drawn into the, the chamber. Um, second stage, the incubation is the compression, right? You're pushing these different things that you thought about together to see if there's reaction. Uh, you know, third stage, there's a spark, bam, you know, the explosion, um, piston fires up, you get motion. And then the last stage is sort of like the reset. You know where the chamber resets um, so that you can uh, go back into the cycle. That may be another take at what you've done or it might be another project altogether, right? Um, in terms of believing your own bullshit, that's really important um, for getting you from, right, uh, those first and second phases into that third phase. Like really important, um, uh, sort of like to getting you from like, well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm seeing something like maybe I'll give this a try. And you can think about like so many of your of your own art um, or others art, right? So many significant pieces um, from the history of human creation that just come out of that sort of like uncertainty of like, ah, oh, well, you know, maybe this will work. Maybe, maybe it won't work. And whether or not just someone has the audacity to give it a try is the thing that you know may or may not decide whether or not exist in our, our history. Um, but for me, you're thinking about insecurity, right, and, and self awareness. That really comes in in that transition between the incubation and the brainstorming phase um, into the articulation phase, right? Because I think what what happens sometimes, and this is different for every art form right, is that you, you have a great idea and then there's the question of like, well, you know, do I have what I need to produce this? Like that's different, like say for a filmmaker. Um, and I, I know, you know, I have a couple of friends out in Hollywood and it's amazing how hard it is um, as just as a filmmaker, but as a, a black female filmmaker to get stuff done, right? You don't have the same access to, um, resources, right? You, you, you don't have the same networks, right? It's, it, it physically like breaks my friends down who are, you know, black female filmmakers, just, you know, just trying to make their, their art, right? You know, um, as opposed to like, for me, a poet, right? You know, maybe it's just the, you know, insecurity of like, well, I don't know enough about a subject. Like, I, I just need to um, do a little more, more reading, right? And then um, I can enter something. But sort of like in that middle, right, um, the insecurity comes in. Um, and I, I think it, it breaks two ways, right? And just in my, this next slide, just sort of like my, my last slide, I can talk about um, why I don't necessarily view in, insecurity as like an uh, inherently negative thing. Um, so I just want to look at the way that I can sort of see insecurity uh, breaking down in terms of how it manifests, like not only just in the creative process, but also um, in our own lives, right? It's sort of like there's the internal and there's the external, right? You, you face up to this moment of, 
I don't know if I can do this. I don't know what I have, if I have, you know, what I need to do this. Um, and that feeling, right, there's just a feeling, I, I think more anything, insecurity has sort of an awareness, right? That awareness can go two directions. Um, it can go internally, right, where you sort of like reflect on the self, or it can go externally, like where you impose it um, on the world. And, you know, just as an aside, right, you know, I would think that a lot of, you know, what we see in the world, you know, sort of from people, again, like what upholds you think about, you know, structural racism is that insecurity projected external, right? If you remember, I think it was probably, yeah, it had to be last week because last week was Juneteenth. There was a, a counter protest of Juneteenth, like somewhere in the Northeast, right? And the question is like, you know, I know this is going to be uh, recorded, but I'm just going to say this. Why the fuck do you need to counter protest Juneteenth, right? Unless, right, you're extending or responding to uh, some insecurity that is within yourself, right? Because I, I honestly say, like, I, I don't feel like the people who are counter-pressing Juneteenth really even understand enough about it to say, I hate it. I hate Juneteenth. Like, who's that? Right? But it, it, it's probably what it is. It's like, I fear what I think this represents for me and my comfort, right? I fear what I, I think this represents for, um, you know, the reality that I, I've come to know, right? So just, just an aside from that. So sort of like the difference between the internal and the external. And I think there are, the, there are positive and negative versions of each of those two branches, right? Uh, so I think if we're just thinking about at the individual level, you know, the way insecurity uh, sort of breaks down, you face this moment, it's like, well, can I, can I produce this, right? Um, in terms of, you know, the internal, like towards the more negative, there's like the sorrow, like, I can't do this. I'm wanting, I'm, you know, I'm bad. I just can't make it happen. Um, and on the external, right, I would say like there's sort of like the surrender or defeat, like, you know, all the sort of process, the, the, the elements external around me, I can't be greater than that. So I, I can't do these things. Um, so I think everything about like the negative side of your security and how it affects the creative process is that at that point, right, if we're thinking about that four step creative process, that's where things shut down. Right, you know, that's where something you know doesn't happen. Um, but then there are sort of more positive ways to think about you know how we utilize the awareness um, of insecurity, right? Which one is growth, right? Where you meet that moment, and you say, you know what, I don't know enough about this, or I need this in order to make this happen, and you go, you go seek it, right? You, you go seek it, you go find it, and one of the most the the reason why I'm still an artist, I would say is that I love that feeling when I can look back on a book or look back on a poem that I wrote and say to myself, wow, I remember when I did not think I could do this shit. Like I remember exactly when it felt impossible that I thought that I was gonna make this happen. And I did, right? Um, and sort of like moving beyond those blind moments, it's, it's, it's a high, it's a rush, right? But it's also difficult, it doesn't happen every time. Um, and so there's, there's that, right? Like when you can sort of turn insecurity into that kind of growth, like an awareness of like, I need to do something in order to grow, right? I don't think it's, it's something that necessarily has to be a, a, a negative thing. And that's something that artists who produce and grow have to do all the time, right? You have to find a way to take your, take that insecurity and turn it into something that evolves your art. Um, and just on the, the other end, um, in terms of like the external, uh, uh, there's sort of like the, the, the antagonism where you can sort of go out and, and this can kind of bend both ways, uh, but like one sort of like you critique the structures um, that are preventing you right, from doing what you want to do, um, or, or it can just be sniping too, right? Um, in that sense that rather than sort of face what's going on within yourself, you sort of, you know, tear down others um, who you may see sort of like uh, successful at some of the things that you you want to try uh, to do. Um, I'm not going to just come back for a minute. Sorry, I was gone so long. Um, so I don't know how many of you saw the, the Michael Jordan documentary, but um, one of the things that I, I found really interesting about it, and I think Michael Jordan is a sociopath, um, but he's an amazing basketball player, um, is that Michael Jordan 
was very good at doing this thing that I do myself, uh, which is sort of like weaponizing one's own success, right? So Michael Jordan, I, I would say, was a spiteful sort of human being uh, in some ways. But a lot of times his way of getting back at you was his own success, right? You say, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punish this person in the basketball court uh, because someone thinks that they're better than me, right? You know, that, that, that there's that meme going around. Just look at it. It's like that guy, I took that person, right? It's like, it's like someone showed up at the game, like, hey, Mike, how you doing? Like, I hope things going well. He's like, well, I took that person, so I need to drop 55 points on that guy, right? Um, I do that myself because honestly, I don't have it within me all the time, right? Just to find my way into turning that insecurity um, that I'm aware of into growth. Like, I just don't have it within me to do it for myself, right? So sometimes I got need that drive to say, you know what, like these people think that, you know, I'm not as good a poet as the other person. I'm going to show them, like I'm going to show them, right? Um, so I, I do use spite um, and I, I, I have no qualms about that. Uh, I, I have that same spite for white supremacy, right? Because I say, you know what, I am going to thrive because I am not going to give you the pleasure of uh, seeing my star, right? I'm gonna thrive because, you know, I, I take that sort of Michael Jordan stance towards that, right? You know, my success, my happiness is going to be, you know, weaponized um, against you, right? Um, so that's that's another way, but I, I just wanna note that, but I, I'm not here to talk about spite. That's a whole other talk. Um, and so there's a, uh, a poet, um, an English uh, romantic poet, um, John Keats, um, who uh, in a letter, he, he coined this term negative capability. Um, if you never heard of it, um, it, it's definitely worthwhile, you know, knowing, looking up as an artist. But um, negative capability um, is, is this idea that one can persist and move through those moments of not knowing what one needs to do, what one needs to learn, how one needs to grow in order to eventually produce the thing that they're trying to produce, um, which is in part why I, I, I suggested that, that icebreaker question um, that you all have been answering. And I love sort of seeing some of the answers because I think it, it, it proves the point, right? Like a lot of those things that you say you had to learn, you had to learn as a result of becoming an aware, can become aware of an insecurity, right? It's saying like, oh man, I need to do this thing, but I don't think I can do this thing. What do I have to learn in order to um, achieve that, right? Uh, so I think, you know, taking that idea of negative capability um, from the creative process, you know, where it, it does a lot of work, but also into one's life is how I think we, you know, eventually move beyond sort of like the Fisher Price level conversations that we have around uh, structural racism um, and all these other things. Because at that point, right, you have to face, you know, this idea like maybe it, it's not so much that, you know, it's other people, like maybe there is something in me and that's the first part, but also knowing that I can grow sort of beyond that, right? That, you know, the insecurity itself isn't a reason to shut down, it's actually, um, a call to grow um, beyond something. Um, the tricky thing about this is, though, I'm just going to wrap up because I really do want to have time to, to have some questions, is that, you know, for myself and, you know, um, also as a teacher, it's very hard to know how to encourage people to have that comfort to exist in their insecurity in a constructive way, right? Um, because we're all people, we're all you know, uh, we have our, our emotions, right? Um, you know, it's hard for me, you know, a, a, as someone who isn't sort of in, in that realm to go back to that point of, um, just my timer, uh, not being a filmmaker, to go to my, my, my Black female filmmaker friends and say, oh, you know, you just gotta, you know, just tough it out and learn from this, like when it's crushing, right? It's crushing to like have your art repeated um, in that, that way over and over again. So. I don't always have the best advice. It's really a person to person thing. Um, but one thing I, I will say that I think can help with it, and I, I think, again, the way this is all coming together in this unique moment, uh, I think we all need to have 
a safe place to fail, right? Um, I think we all need to have a safe space to fail in order to find ways to turn that awareness and insecurity into growth, right? Um, and I really think that the internet and social media is not that place, right? Um, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be an anti-internet person because you know, obviously, you know, internet, we're not doing this. But uh, I think as artists, I've had to do this, you know, for myself. Um, we, we need to be a, a bit more conscious about where I do and don't let social media um, into my creative process, right? You know, how do I do that in ways that's healthy for me, right? Um, because you, we know, like, you know, the social media, internet, it can be a feeding frenzy, right? Um, in a way that destroys your confidence, you know, more than it, it, it enables you to grow, makes you defensive, makes you retreat, right? Um, and, you know, my students ask me about this all the time. Like, I, I feel all this pressure to be on, you know, on the web, but at the same time, they know it makes them feel uncomfortable. And they ask me, like, well, how do you navigate that? I don't really have the answers, but I, I do hope that, you know, having survived this pandemic, which I, which I hope we all do, that, you know, when we can, you know, get back together and be each other's company, we'll have a greater value of sort of like those safe places, you know, for failure, for honest dialogue, for checking each other, for saying the wrong thing um, that we can have, like personally. Um, and that have, after having to do everything on the internet, that will appreciate those spaces sort of like off the books, right? Um, where we can grow as people and sort of not ask to other people to do that labor for us, right? Which sort of to go back to Raquel's point, like a lot of, I don't like this term. So I, uh, the, the terms that I, I'll, I'll say, you know, like I say brown people just because I feel like that covers things, but a lot of brown people are really tired right now because you know we're dealing with our own trauma and also like having to do this work with educating people. Um, but having that space where you know I would say hopefully um, others can can um, do that work themselves, right? And bring what you come to sort of like sharing your insecurities with each other and growing through them back to the pool instead of sort of like drawing from the pool all the time. Right, you need to take from the small pots and put it into the, the big pot. Um, so yeah, I think I just want to stop there because I want to have I want to have time to to talk. Um, but thank you for for hearing me uh, improvise slash ramble a bit as a as a writer, and uh, hopefully we can extend the conversation some more.